what's your take on this attack on the Al Shifa hospital? What they're looking for? What's the reason behind this attack? Of course, the Israelis have said that Al Shifa is a cover for a vast tunnel complex beneath it with rockets and explosives and rifles and ammunition and Hamas, inevitably. Um, plus, apparently, from what the Israelis have released, and I'm very, very skeptical of Israeli propaganda, almost as skeptical as I am of U.S. propaganda, um, there's also some I indication of Hamas throughout the hospital, uh, even in some of the wards that you would think uh, even, even terrorists would caution themselves about going into. I don't know whether to believe this or not. I know the hype that we put up even during the first Gulf War. Remember when we talked about babies being pulled out of incubators and so forth? That, that was all poppy, poppycock. I mean, that, that was crazy. None of that ever happened. Saddam Hussein was a, maybe a bad man in some respects, maybe even evil, but he didn't do some of the things we said he did. So I just don't know, but I do suspect strongly that some of the facilities like that hospital, El Shiva Hospital, are used by Hamas to protect their um, their terrorist networks and so forth, because what else do you have to do? You're being bombed ceaselessly from the air. You have no airplanes to contest that. Um, you don't have much choice. Even, you know, I've always said, I don't care who it is, if it's a terrorist who has no other alternative than terrorism as his means to combat a an entity, a state, or whatever it is, has to go against jets and 250 pound bombs and all the manner of mechanized apparatus that the Israelis and other modern armies can wield. They don't have any choice. That's, that's their weapon. Even hiding behind civilians while it is, uh, against the protocols of war, which we wrote, of course, never thinking we'd have to hide behind civilians. Uh, it may be heinous. It may seem heinous to most normal thinking people, but it is understandable that you have to do this when you're up against odds so great that you have no other choice. The question is how much more, what they want to do in Gaza? What's the end game for Netanyahu administration? There was no strategy. Netanyahu is nothing if not a opportunist. At any moment that something happens, he is a, almost a political genius at capitalizing on that opportunity at the moment. So I think a, a, a strategy is evolving, and I frankly think it's this. We are going to go into northern Gaza and perhaps other parts of it that we can. We are going to kill everything in sight. That which doesn't get killed will leave because it sees it might get killed if it doesn't. Meanwhile, Ben Gavir and a contingent of settlements and settlers are all ready to move into northern Gaza and do precisely what they've been doing in the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and the Golan Heights, which is essentially to dispossess Palestinians of their land and to take it over. Um, so I think there is at least that sort of plan for the northern part of Gaza. The rest of Gaza, I'm hearing all sorts of outlandish plans. One suggested that other countries in the world should be willing to take all the Palestinians that are left from this pogrom. Um, I think that's nonsense. Others have suggested that the Sinai would be a place to temporarily keep them. Well, what is temporary? Um, I just don't see a solution for it. But I do see a strategy evolving where Netanyahu thinks he's going to do much earlier than he had planned. He's going to finish the West Bank. He's going to finish East Jerusalem and such. And he's going to move right into Gaza and begin the same thing. These people who are working with the settlers, I've seen some of the videos. They go into places. They can be ramshackled. They can be fragmented. They can be dynamited. They can be bombed. These people go in, and they're 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 like um, they're like uh, uh, construction agents. They go in and they move everything, and they get all kinds of manpower in there. And before you know it. Six months, a year later, they've got the olive grove going again. They've got a, a ramshackle house built, and they move settlers in. Then they go on to the next and do it again and again. It's a very, very good example of what we did with the Native Americans in the west of our country for a long time. We ethnically cleansed, we murdered, we slaughtered, and then the settlers came in. 
and the gold miners and everything else. They came in, the buffalo hunters and so forth. But that was 175, you know, years ago. We haven't we evolved? Do we still do those sorts of things? Do we still ethically cleanse whole native populations in order to get their land, their gold, their silver? Oh, yes, there's gas that he had a joint contract with the Palestinian Authority to go after off the coast of Gaza. So it really belongs to the Gazans. Doesn't have to worry about that anymore. Now it's all Israel's. When you look at all these weapons that have been sent to the Middle East, the U.S. weapons, nuclear-capable weapons, what's the reason for that? Is there any risk of having a false flag attack, just like what we've seen in Syria? Everything is ready for Netanyahu administration to start a new war, a big war in the Middle East. It worries me. And it worries me that we, during the Trump administration, but certainly starting earlier, began to do things that at, at my time, which ended in 1997, I admit, but at my time, the military was disrecommend every time someone would say it. For example, putting a base in Israel. No, absolute verboten. Um, we wouldn't, we didn't want to do that because we knew if we were in for a penny, we'd be in for a pound. If a Hezbollah rocket came in and hit an American base, uh, then the United States was at war against Hezbollah. Uh, same with Iran, Syria, any other country that might do something. So we were very leery of doing that. You may recall from the first Gulf War, H.W. Bush gained a lot of eb- leverage over Tel Aviv at that time because he told them, you will not respond even if Saddam Hussein shoots a Scud missile into the heart of Tel Aviv. And you may recall, too, he did shoot some Scud missiles at uh, Israel. They did not respond because we had people there to, if they did respond, begin to break our relationship with them. And Bush was that serious about it. We haven't had anybody like that since H.W. Bush. Um, And now we have put all manner of things around Israel that if they are attacked, we're attacked. So your point is well taken. And I'm really worried about the 150,000, I'm told, maybe 170,000 fairly capable missiles that Hezbollah has that Nasrallah is sitting on right now. And because of his lack of real political capital in Lebanon now, I think he's very leery to start anything more than he's doing. I found out today 200,000 Israeli citizens have been evacuated from that border uh, and and from uh, 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 the Gaza conflict. And they're very serious about killing people on that border now. I think it was 11 or 12 Israelis have been killed and countless numbers of Lebanese probably or Hezbollah um, because it's usually three to one or four to one or five to one or worse. So that's another theater that could open up. And my my question there too is if, if all those rockets were to be unleashed near simultaneously or in ripple effect, it would devastate much of Israel. What would we do then? And then you've got the the worst scenario of all, in my view, a very short distance between Turkey and Israel. And you've got Erdogan calling Israel state a state terrorist. Um, you've got him saying things, I'm, I'm listening to the Turkish and looking at the subscripts and asking people, did he really say that? <laughs> and some pretty strong language coming out of Ankara. So Um, And as I said before, the Turkish army is the most powerful land army in NATO, more powerful than our own. Uh, And it's very well equipped. And that would be a game changer for the entire region. And what would the United States do if its NATO ally, anchor of the southern flank of NATO, however, lately it's become questionable about his NATO affiliation, (laughs) attack Israel? Um, I don't think Israel could survive that. So my prophecy that Israel won't be a state in 20 years, two years ago, would come true a lot sooner than I thought. The the potential is there. I'm not trying to say that it's going to happen. I'm just saying the potential is there, which is why we need to do more than we're doing to rein in Netanyahu and to get this situation under, under some kind of decent control. Who's running the show, Larry? The natural Israeli rule, if you will, of turning everything over to the generals when they go to war and the civilians just sit back and watch. With Netanyahu, I doubt very seriously if that's the case. 
And to answer your question directly, ever since Netanyahu, Netanyahu spoke to a joint session of the United States Congress and criticized the sitting president of the United States while he did it, who's been running this show? Bibi. And Bibi is running it now. And Joe can protest, President Biden can protest all he wants to, and he can make remarks in the dark, as it were, that are strong and forceful. Bibi's running the show. If they take all the weapons, all the support, all the help to the Israelis out of that region, what would happen to the Bibi Netanyahu administration? If we cut our support completely, which I think now, after 50 years of experience in the U.S. government is a total impossibility. But if we cut it completely, he'd have to stop. He wouldn't have to stop right away, but he'd have to stop pretty quickly. They are capable of going on, I would say, probably for 30 to 45 days with this kind of bloodshed and so forth. But pretty soon they'd run out of all the things that we give them almost gratuitously. Um, things like the bombs that come off the pylons of the F-16s and such. Um, we're, as Gideon Levy has said before, we're as guilty as the Israelis every time one of those bombs kills a Palestinian child in the street, which is quite a lot of times, we're as guilty. If we took all that away, if we talk, stopped all of our support, plus pulled the carriers out of the Eastern Med and essentially said, we're breaking off contact with Israel, this is too much of a bloodbath, we're not going to tolerate it, they won't listen to us, it'd be over for Israel. You know, when you're attacking civilians, you are yep. playing in the hand of Hamas, not playing against Hamas. I don't think Israel will continue to be a state as it's presently constituted within the next 20 years. I, I'd say within the next decade now. I say that for a number of reasons. First of all, they are a strategic liability, not a strategic asset to the United States. We've always dealt with them during the Cold War. That's what we dealt with them. Taiwan, same thing. You know, an island at the eastern end of the Mediterranean friendly to us that we could land on if we had to fight the Soviets. Same thing with Taiwan. Then they were a strategic asset in that very geostrategic sense, they were an asset. They are now a total liability to the United States, to our reputation, to our power, to our strategic focus. We should be focused on China. China is the real threat to the United States. I'm not saying there's going to be a war there, but there might be if we keep getting weaker and weaker and weaker, and China feels like it could steal the march on us. So, that, focus, that strategic focus is terrible. And this latest development, this development in Gaza that the Israelis should have seen coming like a steamroller down the, down the road. I mean, how many intifadas do we have to have? How many times do we have to go through this iteration where people who are fundamentally slaves, subhuman, kept that way by another state's military and police forces, suddenly reacts to that? And I, I don't care whether it's Hamas or the Palestinian Authority or some outside power that does it for them, like Saudi Arabia or, or Egypt. It's just going to happen. Now, this cycle can only repeat itself so many times, I think. This might be the last cycle. What is Israel after this cycle ends? Is it what Netanyahu wants, which is a greater, the Zionist dream, a greater Israel? It's so big and encompasses all the water, oil, gas, and everything else in that region, and is really giving Jordan and Egypt and Syria a headache every day because they know no one is satisfied with that kind of movement and gain of territory until they've got more and more and more. So that's what the region would be looking at. They would then figure out a way to terminate Israel as an existent state. That's what they're headed for. And yet, You've got this, you've got everything from the U.S. side where John Hagee thinks this is terrific, Christians United for Israel, because it's going to bring about Armageddon, and that's what he's looking for, to the side that says, okay, the only way to protect Israel is to eliminate its enemies. We're starting with the Palestinians, and we'll negotiate with people like the Qataris and the Emirates and Saudi Arabia and so forth. And we'll put cash in front of them, which always gets those Arabs. And when we're ready to smack them, we'll smack them too. But right now, we're just going to keep them close to us. I see that as a, a what, do you, what would you call that? The strategy of a greater Israel. The strategy of the Zionists from the origin, original 
conception. We're we're not just going to have a state. We're going to have a whole bunch of land and a whole bunch of regions. I don't know if Netanyahu's schemes are that grandiose. They certainly won't be satisfied, even if they, there were any possibility they would in his lifetime. That's another thing about these people. And I don't mean Jews when I say these people. I mean these Zionists who are so zestful for other people's property and other people's territory. Um, they don't seem to have a closure for their appetite. You know who they remind me of in that regard? They remind me of Adolf Hitler. And they remind me very much of Adolf Hitler. It's almost like you're looking in a mirror. And more than once, people have said to me, what is this psychological phenomenon of being in a Holocaust, experiencing the Holocaust, and then coming out of it and years later becoming the oppressor yourself? Look at history. There is some of that in history. That, that there is a tendency for the person who has been repressed, oppressed, murdered, slaughtered, reviled, called vermin and everything else, to when they get to the power pinnacle, call others vermin, call others subhuman, and so forth. I'm not saying that's every Israeli. I don't think it is. But it's a certain group of them. Ben Gavir. Ben Gavir, I would accuse that to his face. To his face, I would say that to him, because that's the kind of person Ben Gavir is and the people around him and some of those settlers. I don't have any truck for those people because they're the problem in the world for the last 5,000 years. They're hate-filled. They're ambitious to the point that their hate has to be fulfilled. And that's bothersome. And we're allied with it. Now, we're allied with a state called Israel that has a lot of good people in it, a lot of good people. Netanyahu and his crowd now, I, I don't know how Netanyahu got to this point, but he got there. I think it's as venal as he wants to stay out of jail. But look at who he's allied himself with now. Look at who he allied himself with and what they wanted to do to the Israeli Supreme Court and legal system in general. For example, this, is, this should have been intolerable to the United States. We should have been there in Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, or wherever, protesting with those Israelis who were protesting. We should have been there telling him at that point, you cannot do this and maintain American support. Do you understand, Mr. Prime Minister? But we weren't. Larry, if you look at these many years that Netanyahu was in charge in Israel, what was the outcome? Is he putting Israelis and the people, the Jews who are living now in Israel, in a better place? How do you see this? No, no. And he's not putting the Jews who live in the United States. In New York alone, they almost number those in Israel. They did. They outnumbered them before the Russians immigrated. Um, he's putting them in jeopardy, too. As the rabbi said to me in New York, the greatest motivator for anti-Semitism in the world is Bibi Netanyahu. And, and we're very comfortable here. We have found a country that accepts us, a country that's democratic most of the time, a country that uh, is comfortable for us to live in. And we have prospered here. We have prospered greatly here. He's putting that in jeopardy. And more and more American Jews are beginning to think that way. Unfortunately, some of the ones with the most amounts of money aren't. <laughs> but a lot of average American Jews are beginning to think that way. Let's look at Bibi being finance minister and then coming up. Bibi was directly responsible. I'm not even going to say indirectly. He was directly responsible for the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin. He wanted to end the Oslo process. He wanted to end any attempt at a two-state solution. He wanted to end any attempt at living with the Palestinians in any way other than as their slave, uh, they being his slaves. And so he ginned up the crowds. Go back and look at the videos. Go back and look at those crowds. Go back and look at the people who are in those crowds. He ginned them up. He knew that he was going to create an assassin out there. And also go back and look at what he did for that assassin after he became powerful and could forgive him. Uh, this is an extraordinary story that Americans know nothing about. And then he becomes, after Sharon has set everything up for him, he becomes the real power in Israel. He's got a reputation as a finance minister and then as the prime minister of bringing to the Israelis the best economy they've ever seen. And it was. Guess how he did that? What did he base that on? Illicit oil sales orchestrated by Mark Rich, 
out of the UN Oil for Food Program in Saddam Hussein's Iraq. He got that oil at discounted prices. Oil at discounted prices was the foundation of his plan for Israel's economy to take off, along with adopting Milton Friedman's theories of let's make everybody at the top rich and everybody else poor. But en enough did trickle down in Israel to where everybody was comfortable. Oh, it's Bibi, we know. He's an ass. But man, I'm counting the shekels. I'm doing my thing here. I've I, I, I not had a terrorist attack in my disco for three years. Oh, everything's copacetic. So he bought the Israelis, even though at election and election after election, he barely bought them enough. But he did. Now it's going to come home to roost, I think. And I would have kicked him out right at the beginning. I would, I would have said, as I've said before, I'd have gotten rid of him when I created the unity government. I don't know how you do it under Israeli law, but I, I'd have impeached him, thrown him out. You know, failure. Look at that. I would have impeached George Bush in September of 2001, too, had I been able to do it. Um, and I would have impeached myself, too. Uh, I wasn't in a position to do anything about it because I wasn't in the intel community or the military community at that time. But it, it, And Colin Powell was the only one who was worried about al-Qaeda. Uh, he was worried about him attacking another embassy like they had done. They had killed our people in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam. So we were very worried about al-Qaeda. But nobody else in the administration was. No one was. No one was until they hit us. That was negligence. Well, Netanyahu was negligent, too, and he should have been removed from office, but he wasn't. And long tirade to tell you that Netanyahu's track record has been visible for a long time. And it got really, really bad when he had to go to the alliances he had to go to in order to stay out of jail and stay in power. And that's why he did it. Have you seen his interview with Dan Obash on CNN? Dan Obash asked him if he's going to take responsibility for what has happened on October 7th. How did you find his interview? The same way I find Bill Clinton's interviews and George W. Bush's interviews. I, I think Bill Clinton was probably the worst president America's had in the World War II, post-World War II period. I can I just point out to you all the problems and, and, and uh, uh, now failures that we can go back to Clinton's administration and find the initiation of. I think it's the same thing is going to be true of Netanyahu in the long run. But these kind of people, George W. Bush, for example, maybe a little bit of contrition in his book where he said, if I'd known there were no WMD, I wouldn't have gone to war. That's that's contrition, I guess, of a sort. But I've heard his comments lately and his comments lately don't show me that he's learned anything at all, that he's still the same cowboy he was when he was president in those first four years. And as Powell said, he pulled his 45 out and started shooting, and Powell didn't know how to get him put it away. That is sort of Netanyahu with a brain. Um, I'm not saying Bush is stupid, but I'm not saying he's the brightest light bulb in the in, in the network. Uh, Netanyahu is a very smart guy, very smart guy. He wouldn't have stayed in power as long as he has if he weren't. But the me means by which he stays in power are despicable, despicable. Um, Agitating to get the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin being probably the most despicable one of all. Could I prove that? I don't know, but I've watched the Israeli video made by Israelis, about a third of which is actual footage, actual footage of Netanyahu's rallies, political rallies, actual footage of the assassination. And I think they're right. How do you see the reactions that's coming from Hamas taking into account these attacks on hospitals? The Israelis have one thing going for them in an operational sense, and that is that Hamas has very little capability. They have the capability to do what they did on October the 7th, mainly manifested out of surprise. And they have the capability to do damage if the Israelis are somewhat inept in the way they move through the rubble and the damaged territory seeking to kill Hamas fighters. And they have an advantage in the fact that they're guerrillas. Guerrillas always have a certain advantage. But the state, especially when the state is backed by the number one state, militarily speaking, we're the death merchant of the world now. We sell more arms than anybody else in the world. Uh, they've got a real, <laughs> they, they just can't win. Uh, so they have, to, they have to go to things like the October 7th attack, sad to say. Can they do more of that? Sure, uh, in time and letting 
the guard slip again and gaining surprise, tactical surprise. But can they do anything really without a lot of support from some other external power or powers who are better equipped, more modern uh, militaries, for example? Can they do anything without that kind of support? Probably not. I think the long-term win for Hamas, if win is the right word, nobody wins in this kind of war. But the long-term gain for Hamas is the same thing as the long-term gain for Osama bin Laden. In his 1997 fatwa, I think it was, 97 or 98, he essentially said, and I suspect Amin al-Zawahiri wrote this, the real, and me, to me, the real operational brains of al-Qaeda was the Egyptian doctor, Zawahiri. He said, my, my purpose is to bring down the great Satan. And I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to hit them, and they're going to unravel. Wow. Since 9-11, the United States has done more stupid things in a shorter period of time and eroded its power in a shorter period of time than ever in its history, national or pre-national. So bin Laden is, in some respects, getting his wishes fulfilled, even though he's long since dead. Hamas could win in that respect, too. They can make it so difficult for Israel to do what it wants to do, and I just told you what they really want to do, over time and immediately, that Israel loses more and more and more and more reputation, power, loses allies, loses friends. People are backing away from organizations that featured the Israelis as observer status, for example, with the African Union. Very powerful statement by South Africa about why they didn't want Israel in, in the Union, even as an observer. Um, that way, Hamas could win. Is that a win? Because you haven't really done anything for the Palestinians. They're still lying there prostrate, landless, you know, no home. Um, I don't think anybody wins in this. There is no victory in this, any more than there's a victory in Ukraine, other than Russia has taught NATO a lesson. And, they, and I think aided and abetted the eventual dissolution of NATO. Uh, and maybe that was one of Putin's long-term strategic goals. I suspect it was. Um, and now that we see Germany trying to take over, Olaf Scholz saying he's going to take over for the United States, backing out of its support for Ukraine. Yeah, that's pitiful. That that's just pitiful. That that is NATO's, you know, saying, well, go back, Washington, we'll take care of it for you. We can't, but we'll take care of it for you. We know that Hezbollah were talking about that they're not looking for escalation in Gaza. Are they going to attack Israelis? Are we going to have some sort of bombing? I could say no and be mistaken, and they could attack full force tomorrow morning. <laughs> but here's what I think. I think we give too much credit to the relationship between Nasrallah, Hezbollah, and Iran. Too much. I don't think he takes orders from anyone except himself, um, and maybe a council. But that said, much of his more sophisticated armaments, probably, if not in whole, uh, in the majority of them, they come from Iran. So that's some kind of hold Iran has over him. Think of that for a second. And then my second point is they really have, since the explosion in the harbor, um, all political authority in Beirut and in Lebanon at large has lost all credibility with the Lebanese, I think, especially the Be Beirut Lebanese, Beirut Lebanese. How do you say Beirutian? Is it Beirutian? <laughs> Beirutian? <laughs> I don't know how you say that. <laughs> so, so he's got to be very careful about how he acts from Lebanon because the Israelis will bomb Lebanon as they've shown many times in the past and they don't they're not very discriminating about the targets they bomb they'll bomb all manner of what remains of Lebanon's economic capability so if he does that then the Lebanese just might shoot him <laughs> so he's got to be careful about Iran who's probably trying to restrain him right now I would guess they do not want the United States attacking them they'll be they'll be bellicose they'll lob missiles into Iraq. They'll incite Iraqi militias that are Shia and working for them, you know, into attacking U.S. troops. But they won't do anything overt that gets us putting force onto Iran. 
And I think the same thing goes with Hezbollah. So we're getting fighting. The Israelis have evacuated the border. Um, some people are dying. But I think that nuisance value, I guess you would say, is what Hezbollah is providing right now for Hamas. Um, I don't think it'll go any further than that. I hope I'm I don't hope I'm right. I just hope they don't enter the fray, because if they do, then we got to change situation. I think we've got a two front war, maybe a three front war, because it would probably be coordinated with Iran back to tax out of Syria, too. Um, and maybe you've got a real uh, catastrophe on your hands that the United States may actually feel like it has to enter. And that's not good at all. It seems that the U.S. foreign policy in Gaza is totally different from that of the Netanyahu administration. They're talking about keeping Gaza in their control. But the U.S. Oh, yeah. says that is not correct. They have to leave Gaza. Who's going to win in this disagreement between the U.S. and Israel? Let me, say, let me take some counsel from history. How many times have we listened and acted Uh, contrary to Israel's interests in the long run, or even the short run, especially Netanyahu run Israel. We just don't have the courage. We do not have the courage politically or actually morally to stand up to Netanyahu. I hope President Biden makes a liar out of me tomorrow morning, but I doubt it very seriously. Is that a viable choice to stay in Gaza? Look at what's been happening up to this point. The IDF has had its real fighting skills, the kind of skills you saw displayed in the 67 war, for example, or the 73 war, for that matter, atrophied greatly because it's been on occupation duty. For 20 years, it's been on occupation duty. What will this do? And this is not an exercise of their armored expertise in Gaza. This is an exercise of brutal killing. That's all it is. It's almost an exercise of like going into a garbage dump taking a couple of rifles with you and shooting at rats. There's no challenge to this at all, other than the sophistication required to do urban warfare. And that sophistication is not all that different, really, from the kind of things you have to do on occupation duty. So, yeah, this is this is good. I can do this. But ask them to fight a real full-up war, armored warfare, against somebody who's halfway decent. Probably wouldn't be able to do it. That's the reason the Turks worry me coming down, <laughs> because I think they would defeat the Israelis overnight virtually. What would that do to the complexion of things in that end of the world? I'll tell you what it would do to uh, the new Ataturk. It would pole vault him into leadership of the Muslim world from uh, Joe Widodo's Indonesia to. Uh, did you notice the first words out of Widodo's mouth? We're got to stop the killing in Gaza. <laughs> that should have told President Biden something. Here I am sitting down with this man, and the first words out of his mouth are about Gaza. That should have told him something. You know, Indonesia, outside of India's Muslim population, is the largest Muslim population in the world. Uh, he had to say something like that. If, if that surprised Joe, then Joe needs to go to go to school. Um, so, I think we're we're, we're in a situation where. If we don't do something pretty shortly, the 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 chance that something forceful and courageous, pretty short, morally and physically, pretty shortly, we're going to ride in the same boat as Netanyahu, and that is not a good boat with the world moving away from the dollar, with our 33 trillion dollars of aggregate debt, with a Congress that couldn't pass anything worthwhile if it tried with a Congress that is not even cooperating with the executive branch and vice versa, even though the slim majority is the executive branch's party, with a president who's below in the polls to Donald Trump for 2024, with an absolute disaster in the armed forces where we can't recruit enough people to even fill the small ranks that they're there now, and the propensity to serve amongst 18 to 24 year olds is the lowest it's been in the history of that polling, 8%, 8%. How in the world can we maintain our power, especially against a country like China, which is just vibrant economically, industrial base and everything else. People tell me, oh, China's got this problem, got that problem. China has more ships than we had in World War II. 
it's incredible. We we can't build ships. China builds ships every month. We can't build a single ship unless we take a whole year and consolidate a shipbuilding workforce from all across the country, put it in Norfolk or put it in Pascagoula or somewhere or Bath in Maine and build a ship. China builds ships all over the place. That's what we're up against. And we are frittering away, as Mearsheimer, John Mearsheimer keeps saying every time I see him on, we're frittering away our strategic outlook, our strategic focus in the Mediterranean, and we were in Ukraine. It's insane. We're insane. We are certifiably insane. When you look at, you talk about, you keep talking about Turkey because it's so important for Israel, for the NATO as well. How do you yep. see, when you see the way that they treated the Iranian foreign minister and they treated Antony Blinken? When... I forgot. I got to turn the okay. oven off. Okay. I, okay. Pro I, I probably ruined it. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Did you save it? I don't know. I'll have to look. It's a, it's a sweet <laughs> potato I was baking. <laughs> That's my supper for tonight. <laughs> so when when you look at the way that the Iranian foreign minister was treated in Turkey, comparing to how Antony Blinken was treated, how do you find the difference? How do you find this changing that's happening in that region in the Middle East? If they're treating Antony Blinken like this, you can imagine what would happen to Israelis. How You're right. I, I can't imagine an Israeli leader, unless he's completely cordoned off by security services, or an American leader going anywhere in the Middle East or to any Muslim-majority country or even non-Muslim majority country and not being absolutely ridiculed and reviled and protested. And I was watching Medea Benjamin today and in front of Israelis. I don't know if you saw it. I recommend the video to you. She's in front of the Israelis who are protesting for Israel, um, American Jews protesting for Israel. Might have been some Israelis there too, but mostly American Jews, I think. Most of whom I saw in the video were women. You would not believe the invective, the profanity, the cursing, the epithets that they were hurling at this brave woman standing out there with a sign that said something like, they're killing Palestinians. It's genocide. It's murder. They were so indicative of the hate-filled world we now are conjuring. And the U.S. is responsible for a lot of that hate that you just wanted you just wanted to lean back in your chair and say, check me out, God, I don't want to live here anymore. If those are the kind of people that are representing Israel and their love for Israel amongst the Jewish community in the United States of America who are hurling that kind of invective at this woman who's out there peacefully protesting, I want nothing to do with them. Get them out of my country is what I would say. Xi Jinping was in the U.S. He had a meeting with Joe Biden. And right after that, Joe Biden again called him a dictator. <laughs> I don't know what kind of diplomacy, what kind of treatment is that? What he's going to accomplish by these statements? These are so hmm. juvenile statements. There is no necessity for such statements. How do you find it? I think he's taking a, a, a page out of Trump's book. I think he thinks Trump is leading him in the polls, and Trump's rhetoric is successful, therefore he'll assume some of it. Um, I can't imagine anything other than that. Perhaps I can go back to the past when Powell and I um, were working with Dick Luger and Joe Biden on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and Powell would come back to me after a conversation and say, man, that guy just doesn't know how to control his mouth. I'm glad he's not president. Actual comment from Colin Powell. Because he didn't. And the next day he would look at it and some staffer would point out to him that it was pretty stupid what he'd said, politically and otherwise. And he would just, you know, brush it off, say, I'll do better next time. So he knew that he had a problem with his mouth, but he never did learn, as Powell again said, Joe never learned to control his mouth. 
Um, as vice president, he was always under the shadow of Barack Obama, who had a very eloquent mouth, uh, very eloquent uh, speeches and everything else. Part of the reason that he won me over when he did. <laughs> I wish he hadn't been so eloquent. Um, I'm not saying that Barack Obama wasn't a, a, at least a better president than Bill Clinton. He certainly was. Um, but when he met with me in the Roosevelt Room and more or less apologized to himself about doing Libya in front of us, uh, I realized that uh, the man had been snookered. He'd been snookered by Hillary Clinton and he'd been snookered by Samantha Power into taking Gaddafi out when, in fact, what he was doing, and he should have known this, was putting Libya in turmoil for an inestimable number of years. Uh, Libya now, uh, in many in many ways, is a basket case. Um, and Gaddafi was keeping that from happening. So did we do good there? No. Tell me any place we have done done well. Uh, so, yeah, you're right. It was stupid. It was just stupid, colossally stupid. You don't just don't do that. You don't do it as a president of the United States, and you don't do it if you're trying to conduct diplomacy with a guy that might next week box your ears and box them pretty badly. Um, are you doing that so he won't box your ears? I'm sorry, you haven't done your study of the Chinese, if that's what you think. John Mearsheimer keeps talking about the pure competitor of the U.S. is China. We have to focus on China. How about this focus? What does it mean? It means that the new conflict, new war in Taiwan? Yeah, I think what it means is what you're insinuating earlier with your remark about Biden's uh, impolitic remark about Xi Jinping being a dictator, he's still a dictator. Uh, I think he was asked a question by the press, and Biden said, well, he is. <laughs> Come on. You don't understand, Mr. President, what diplomacy is all about. And you're the chief diplomat of the country. You're the chief diplomat of the most powerful country in the world for the time being. I'm not even sure that it's accurate for the time being. You're looking at, as John says, three poles out there now. We just can't get used to this. We're we're used to this uni unipolar moment. and and Actually, the last few years of the Cold War were sort of unipolar, too. If you looked at the intelligence estimates, the CIA knew Russia was falling apart. Reagan just wouldn't let him say it because he needed Star Wars and he needed billions and billions of dollars to build up the armed forces. And he wasn't going to get them unless he said the Soviet Union was 10 feet tall. The CIA knew they were having economic problems and they knew they were going to you know, really have a difficult time making it through to the 90s, especially with the uh, the aftermath of Afghanistan on top of the economic problems. Um, so that's what we do. We, we hype them and that sort of thing. Do we need to do that today? Do we need to do that uh, in a more focused manner? Um, is it true? Do we not even need to do that? Because it is true that China is a, a powerful country. Well, both things are probably operating at the same time because we are who we are and they are who they are. And power, as John says, power is the real question here. And China's power exceeds ours now, period. It exceeds ours now. China looks a lot like the United States looked to George Marshall, Dwight Eisenhower, Wiedemeyer, and a whole bunch of other military officers who were looking at our industrial base and trying to figure out if it could expand to the point it could support 12 to 15 million men under arms and fight two wars on two fronts, the Pacific and the European or Atlantic. And at the same time, look at see if they could fight in both of those oceans in order to get to where they had to fight to do the real trick. Um, and that's why they wanted the Soviets to be attacked by Germany, too, so that the Soviets would come in the war and give them a lot of help on that front, help that actually won the war in Europe. Uh, these are the kinds of things you think about in the period before the war. And the people who were thinking about the logistics and the, and the base knew that Yamamoto was right when he said, apocryphally or not, he was right. I fear that all we've done is awakened a sleeping tiger and filled it with a fearful resolve because as a captain, he'd been in the United States. This Japanese officer had been in the United States for an extended period of time. Um, getting an education, as I recall, somewhere around El Paso, Texas, or whatever. And he knew that we were a sleeping giant. 
we had the industrial capacity to fight two wars on two separate fronts, supply the free French, supply the British, supply the Soviets. The Soviets would never have done Stalingrad without that supply line coming out through, up through Iran. We did all of that with our industrial base. Now China has that base and we have virtually nothing. So you can imagine how people like Marshall and Eisenhower and so forth would be sitting around today saying, wow, tell the president to tone down his rhetoric. It seems that there are some disagreement within the Zelensky administration between him and Zeluzhny. They're trying to silence Zeluzhny because of his statements. I think what you're seeing is what you see in uh, a variety over history's time of losing powers in conflicts and wars. You're seeing dissension. You're seeing the leadership fall apart. You're seeing people looking for blame, pointing fingers. And I, I suspect in Kiev it goes on now 24-7. Um, I don't know how Zelensky is going to deal with it, but I suspect a lot of it is being stirred up, if not motivated by us and by others who are on our side, if you will, in the sort of propaganda world. Um, we are trying to figure some way to distance ourselves from him, from the war, and to get out of it and get away from it and to stop sending money there. Uh, I think that's uh, inevitable, was inevitable. I think it's unconscionable that we got there in the first place, really, and that we sustained it for so long, knowing full well because months ago, any military professional could tell you it was over in terms of whether or not Ukraine had any possibility of achieving a victory or even a stalemate that was favorable to them. It was over. So why stick it out because you're politically sensitive, domestically speaking, and because you can't cut and run until you got at least 55, 56 percent of the Americans sick and tired of it? And then you can fall into that and support yourself still running for president again. So it's a complicated thing, but never rule out domestic politics and never rule out for this country, America, stupidity. In your opinion, the case of the conflict in Ukraine is already dead for the U.S. politicians from both sides, Republicans, Democrats. Are they going to send more weapons, more money to Ukraine? Are they going to demand Zelensky to go after negotiations? How do you see the future of Ukraine? Well, that would be a magnificent vote fast for us, change of face, uh, uh, it, it, to, to suddenly come out tomorrow morning or next week uh, saying, no more money for you. Um, by God, you've got to do this, do that. So what we've done, I think, is talk to Germans. We've talked to Olaf into kind of taking the interim burden. So initially, he's going to continue the support. So it looks like to our electorate that all Biden did is pass it off to the strongest state in Europe. And that'll be OK. Well, it's not going to be OK. Germany's not going to be able to handle this. In fact, the weight of trying to manage it might just, it, it probably will put his government out of office, but it just might sunder Germany in a way that people will regret. It, it might give them some real problems and put this alternative to Germany party in power, for example, who look a lot like uh, uh, they might be dangerous. Uh, and, and yet they're the second polling party in Germany now, I'm told. That would not be a good development, but that's what we're doing, running around the world, producing situations that when we cut and run from them, they turn out to be pretty bad. Or when we support them for too long, they turn out to be pretty bad. Or when we cause them, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Leb uh, Libya, they turn out to be pretty bad. Um, we haven't done anything. I was talking with a couple of generals today. And one of them said, we haven't done anything, Larry, we haven't done anything really positive in a long time, have we? And I said, certainly not since 9-11. Well, we got bin Laden, one of them said, and we, and we pretty much eliminated al-Qaeda. I said, we didn't eliminate al-Qaeda. It's still out there. Did we eliminate their potential capacity to come and attack us again? Maybe we did for the interim period, but what we're doing right now with respect to Gaza is inciting a lot of them to come back again. So just... Consider what Ali Soufan is saying about there were maybe this many al-Qaeda on 9-11. There's maybe five times that many today. 
and just consider that someone like Zawahiri or bin Laden or whatever will get into a leadership group and take some al-Qaeda uh, group with him and plot another one. And we'll have another 9-11. That's what we're looking forward to because we are creating a whole world that hates our guts. How do you see the relation of the U.S. and Russia in the aftermath of any possible negotiations in Ukraine? We pretty much soured that ground so badly that I, I would be surprised if Vladimir Putin would even walk it. But he showed me in the past that he can be a, a, a supremely competent pragmatist when he wants to be. So if he saw it economically, politically, security-wise in his interest to sort of reconcile with Washington, I have no doubt that he would do it in a heartbeat. What that would mean is we would have to pull him away from Beijing. That would be an astute thing to do, and it might be something that he realizes would be an astute thing for us to do, and so he seeks it. Because ultimately, the Russian affinity for Washington, no matter how many crimes we commit, is greater than the Russian affinity for Beijing. Um, don't ask me why. It, that goes back a long way. But um, So... I wouldn't put it past Putin to make that a shorter span of time than we might think um, if he's still in power that long. And I don't see any chance other than health-wise that he might leave power anytime soon. Um, I might be a little panglossy in there, but whatever subsequent ruler comes in, I think their affinity for Washington and a relationship with Washington is still stronger than it is for one with – we forced them into the one with Beijing. We forced them into it. 